The Holy Gospel according to John as found in the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who, pardon me, those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. So, I want to talk about the reading from Acts. I had two questions. Well, I had a lot of questions, but I'll just talk about two questions. The first question is, just who is this Ethiopian official? Our reading tells us that he is a court official of the Candace, which is what they call the queen of Ethiopia. And he is in charge of her entire treasury. This is a position of great authority and power. And if we read between the lines, we know that he is well-educated. He's reading from the Hebrew scriptures. We also know that he's probably financially comfortable, if not wealthy. He has the financial resources to ride in a private chariot and to purchase his own scroll of a biblical text. And those were not cheap back then. Everything was handwritten. He is a devout individual. So much so that he has arranged time away from his important position to travel 800 miles to travel to worship in the temple, at the temple in Jerusalem. And we know that this man is spiritually hungry. He makes this trip knowing that he will not be allowed into the temple. That's why I said at the temple, or corrected myself. He's not allowed because beyond the outer court, because, as our reading also tells us, he is a eunuch. So then I needed to ask what the Bible says about eunuchs, and I think I just added another question, because I still have one after this. Deuteronomy has some very uncomfortable language, with apologies that would, to those who would rather not hear this. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose penis is cut off, shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. It's no wonder that we don't read that section of Deuteronomy as part of our regular cycle of readings. So that's the eunuch, the Ethiopian official. I know that the Bible calls him eunuch over and over and over again because they want to make the point that this is the boundary that Philip is crossing but I would rather refer to him as the Ethiopian official, just as I don't, you know, refer to my friend in Rancho Gotova as my gay pastor friend, you know. So she's just my friend and she's a pastor. So context is where we're looking at, um, is what I wanna look at. Where does this story actually begin? What's the setup? What's happening here? We have a nice beginning, an angel of the Lord speaks to Philip, but this is, is this really where the story begins? Are we at the beginning, the middle, or the end? We could say that this story begins with that uncomfortable verse from Deuteronomy, the words that exclude eunuchs from the temple. Or it may begin with the words of Isaiah, who say that this exclusion will someday change. Isaiah writes, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, 
who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house, in the temple, and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Encouraging words for this Ethiopian, Ethiopian official. From a different perspective, this story might start with a young boy who was chosen for castration in a system that protects the powerful at the expense of others. Men could not serve close to the queen. And so they chose intelligent people, who, young boys who showed a, a, a perspective for being, well, being able to be educated, to learn to do jobs around the court that put them close to the queen, and they castrated them. So this person is both marginalized and privileged. She's going to get a life that has him living in the court, gives him an opportunity to succeed and pursue his, his, um, his own direction spiritually, but it comes at a cost. So questions, and you've probably all noticed, at least some of you, that I ask a lot of questions when I preach, and I frequently don't answer them, because that's your job. Questions are an important part of studying scripture, but not just our questions, not just the questions I'm asking about this text, but the questions asked within the text. Today, Philip is instructed by the spirit to approach the chariot. He asks, do you understand what you are reading? He does not ask about the Ethiopian official's sexual status. He does not say, why are you a eunuch reading from the scroll of Isaiah? He says, do you understand what you are reading? He asks a relevant question. And the official answers with a question of his own. How can I, unless someone guides me? He's looking for a teacher. So Philip begins to share with him the good news about Jesus. This brings us to that statement that I love from this official. We had repeated it in our Thanksgiving for baptism that began our service on Easter day. Look, here is water, followed by a question. What is to prevent me from being baptized? I sometimes wonder if he's testing Philip a little bit. But, and Philip could have given many answers to that question. He could have kind of hemmed and hawed about eunuchs. He could have made excuses. Oh, well, I'm not really authorized to do that. But instead, he chose an inclusive answer. He went down into the water and baptized this Ethiopian official who was welcomed into the family that would later be called Christian. Philip helped the early followers of Jesus break down barriers. The walls put up to divide insiders from outsiders, the familiar from the unusual, these needed to come down. His boldness in doing this moves the Ethiopian from confused reader to insightful theologian in the span of a couple verses for us. This insight allows him to ask with confidence and maybe a little test, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The question shows that he gets it. He understands that the Easter message brings new possibility for him and for all of those that have been on the outside. People need to hear that message. And I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm talking here about people you see on the light rail, the person who gets the dreaded center seat on your flight to somewhere, maybe the young mother in front of you in the checkout line at the grocery store. Maybe we can be their Philip, not necessarily sharing overtly the good news of Jesus Christ, but speaking to them in a way that is welcoming. That person you see on the light rail who probably may not smell so good, that person may be unhoused. A lot of times in the heat of summer and the rain of winter, unhoused people will buy a ticket and ride the light rail all day long to stay out of the rain and out of the heat. 
They may not know where there is a library they could go to, or the library they're used to may have stopped welcoming them in to sit and use the computer all day and read all day. That person in the center seat probably feels pretty persecuted. Smiling at them and speaking pleasantly to them might be what they need to lift up their day, and who knows, might actually lead to a conversation. And the young mother you in front of you at the checkout line in the grocery store, I have a personal policy. When the lines are long in the grocery store, I try to find a line that has at the end where I'm going to join in a mother and a small child in her cart. That's what I look for. And if it's not the shortest line available, I go stand behind the mother with the small child and I help her engage that child who may or may not be having a good time at the grocery store. I might play peekaboo with them, with the mom's permission, of course, and you know all those little things and talk to them and gives mom the ability to just take a moment and load her groceries onto the conveyor belt. Because if your child is constantly grabbing at you, that's something hard to do. And so you can lift up that person's day. I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm remembering subtly, and I'm free associating here as opposed to following my pages. But I remember reading something that was a sort of an interpretation about about being Christian of one of the ancient writers who said, you know, speak the gospel with your life or some such thing like that. You know, the trick to being a Christian is to let people know you're a Christian and don't be a jerk about it. So, so even this, this is Christ-like behavior. You're not saying, hi, I'm doing this because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But you're behaving towards these people in a Christ-like manner. And I think that's really important. And Philip told this Ethiopian about Jesus and his welcoming love. And that's an example of welcoming love, about his concern for the outcast, the prisoner, the despised, the rejected. He told him that he, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, was loved by God and that the door was open to him. I think we do a reasonable job here with our LGBTQ welcome. We do still have one challenge ahead of us in that, and that will be probably the first one time someone who is openly trans or gender fluid walks into our church, because as far as I know, we have not had that experience. So that's something we'll have to try and not mess up when it happens. Um, we struggled with our unhoused people who were making this their home. We, we felt it was, it was the Jesus thing to do to allow them a place to sleep, but they did not respect our property. And our property people were constantly picking up trash, dangerous trash, needles, and I won't say, the, well, I said penis earlier, so, but you know, the, the, the rappers, um, the, a lot of those were picked up, and, um, and also human waste was constantly piling up. And so we had, to get, we had to come down on that and say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do this. Um, we do, however, do fairly well with the homeless who come into our worship service. I miss Juan. I wonder, I, I hope that he lived through COVID. I, I really do, because he would come here regularly particularly loved coming during Lent because we had soup afterwards. And um, yeah, sometimes he was a little annoying with wandering around asking folks if they could give him a few bucks to go to Del Taco. But he and I talked about that and I said, you know, you ask me about that, don't ask the rest of the people. But, um, but we do pretty well with that. We do that well here. So we need to learn how to do that well outside of here. And that starts with us as individuals doing that well outside of here. Because as a group, we have reached out with our food pantry that's here on site, with the food basket each month, um, with, with a lot of different ways we can help people who have needs that aren't being met in this economy. But, um, but I think we need to branch out into doing that as individuals, because I believe that that will 
give us more ideas on how we can do that as a community. So I'm going to stop talking now because I've long since lost track of where I am in my, in my prepared message. Um, and just say amen.